Welcome to Severe Heights. If it's your first time with us online, we're so glad you dropped by. And if you're here to rewatch a past message, you're in the right place. If you have questions about service times, giving, next steps, or if you want to learn more about who we are, click the link in our description or just visit severeheights.org. Thanks so much for being here. Let's jump into Sunday's message. I'd like to begin this new series um, really spending some time addressing the topic of being with God in a season of disappointment. I want to begin with a question, and the question is this. Have you ever felt stuck? For the last couple months, if uh, you know our story, you can imagine that in a real sense, I've felt stuck. Um, I've felt stuck like uh, ever since I call it my incident. Um, after the surgeries and the progress, like, like it's just, it's taking a lot of effort and a lot of patience to get where I hope to be. And I feel like, like every day, sometime or another, I just reflect a little bit of anxiety about being stuck here and not sure how to move forward. Like this past week in particular, I, I've told you guys, there have been moments of progress and things have gone great. This past week was a little tough. Like at rehab on Tuesday, uh, I'm at the University of Tennessee, the hospital for cardiac rehab. And uh, this week just happened to be one of those weeks that I was struggling and in particular, I was on one machine, almost 30 seconds from finishing, and the room started getting a little tipsy, like uh, everything's spinning. And before you know it, I found myself on the ground while everyone else is working out around me, 20, 30, 40 years older than me, and I am throwing up in a bucket after t time and time and time again, five times. It was beautiful. <laughs> um, if you can imagine like, uh, like, Sneezing and coughing hurts the chest that's still broken. Uh, imagine what vomiting does to the chest, right? But even more pain than that was what it did to my ego. Uh, it was awful, like just humiliated. So much so that if you heard the story previously about after my surgery and when I left the hospital, I snuck my way around and wasn't able, like I was able to avoid the wheelchair. Uh, at rehab, they made me stay. They wouldn't let me drive. Um, they made me call someone to pick me up and they forced me out in a wheelchair. So the person that picked me up got this picture and immediately as soon as I got out, I'm like standing to the side, didn't want to be seen there. Like, like I have felt stuck with my progress, stuck with a sickness, stuck with the, uh, the complications of the surgery, like, like just stuck. But let me ask a question a little bit further. Have you ever felt hopelessly stuck? Some of you right now are hopelessly stuck. Let's say it's a marriage that you feel like you're no longer in love, you're, you're roommates. Let's say it's a child and making difficult decisions and you're wondering, will it ever get better? But it feels hopelessly stuck. Uh, perhaps it's at a job. You're stuck. You don't know when you'll get out. It, it doesn't get much worse. You're stuck not being able to get pregnant. You're stuck with terrible anxiety. You're hopelessly stuck and single. Single again. You're hopelessly stuck in the middle of an addiction. It's like you've made some progress, but you've slipped up again, and you're like, there's no way I'll ever get out of this. You find yourself stuck. I understand at the heart of the Christi Christian faith, there are three days in the New Testament. You got to remember um, the Christian faith at its heart is a historical faith. And those three days are Friday, day one. Saturday is day two. And Sunday is day three. As you can see, day two is stuck between day one and day three. Day one was a day of unbelievable pain. It was a day where Jesus would be put on trial in front of the Sanhedrin. He would weep tears of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. He would be thrown in front of Pilate. Jesus would be tortured by the soldiers. He would be placed on the cross. And it's at that moment that the sin of the world would do its deepest work. Jesus would take on himself the sin of humanity. God himself would describe what happened when sin entered the world back in the book of Genesis. The ground is now cursed, God would say, because of sin. And the ground will grow thorns and thistles for you. When the soldiers mocked Jesus on day one, they made him a crown of thorns. He literally took on the curse of sin for all of us. 
Day one, the darkest day in human history. But day three, literally the greatest day in the history of humanity. On day three, that stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. It's the day that death was defeated. Day three is the reason that we have hope. But today, I don't want to talk about day one. And I don't want to talk about day three. I want to talk about the other day. Day two is the day that feels like us, hopelessly stuck. Because day two is the day after. But it's also the day before. It's after day one, but before day three. It's after Friday, but before Sunday. It's after a prayer is asked, but before it's answered. It's after your world falls apart, but before it's mended. As your, it's after your dream is destroyed, but before it's built back. It's after someone you love dies, but before you see him again. It's after your deepest disappointment, but before the greatest joy. I'm telling you, day, day two is stuck right in the middle of day one and day three. So I want us to consider today, what what happened on day two? It felt like nothing. Every crisis, think about it, every crisis has adrenaline. Day two, the adrenaline has run off. It is gone. It is out. And you're trying to find, but you can't. You can't find motivation for moving. You can't find reason for living. Day one and day three, they have so much activity, so much detail, so much adrenaline. We we could talk a whole year about day one and day three. On day one, our sins were paid for. On day three, our hope was brought to life. Ready? But on day two, it feels like nothing happened. For all practical purposes, day two is a day of silence. So let's think about day two. Not necessarily from our perspective. Let's think about day two from the New Testament perspective and let's go to the disciples. Think about it. Day two, they haven't slept for 48 hours. They finally collapse on a Friday night. They wake up on day two. Everything's quiet. The people that were screaming for Jesus to be crucified, they're silent. And the crowds are gone. Everyone has gone home because guess why? Jesus is dead kind of strange. The gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John don't tell us what happened to the disciples on day two. Maybe they gathered quietly and they reminisced about Jesus and his teachings. They retold some of the stories that he told on the hillside or on the shoreline. Maybe they remembered the day that he uniquely called each of them. It was three years ago. He was miraculously gifted, they would say. But now he's gone. On day two, they realized they thought he would change the world. And day two made it obvious he didn't. Maybe on day two, the disciples talked about what went wrong. They don't want to say it, but in their hearts, they feel like Jesus failed. He didn't gain enough followers He didn't win over the religious leaders. He didn't make peace with Rome, right? Uh, He couldn't convince enough normal people to embrace his way of life. He couldn't even convince the disciples how to courageously handle a crisis. Maybe he failed. And the disciples are reminiscing, thinking, what about what he said on the cross? On the cross, he didn't say with confidence, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. No, on the cross, at noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Then at three, Jesus called with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And they reflected on when Jesus taught in Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount, God blesses those who are humble for they will inherit the whole earth. Jesus was humble, but all he had inherited was six feet of the earth. On day two, the disciples realized that the man who claimed to be the son of God was abandoned by God. 
And that gave them no hope. They were stuck in deep disappointment. And therefore, Mark 14 says, then all his disciples deserted him. And they ran away. Well, let's draw parallels between the disciples on day two and us as we're stuck in deep disappointment on our day two. Here's what I'm trying to say. Day two is the day after your deepest dreams have died. Meaning you wake up, you're still alive. You have to go on. You don't know why. And you don't know how. That's day two. And we owe it to ourselves to ask ourselves this question. Um, why is there a day two in the New Testament story? Like, why didn't Jesus just die and then come back from the dead? Meaning, why are there two events, but, but three days? Why couldn't he just die on day one and then come back on day two? Well, Paul talks about this tension he says it this way, 1 Corinthians 15, I passed on to you what was most important and what also had been passed on to me, that Jesus died for our sins just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on day three, just as the scriptures said. There's deep significance in day three. The Old Testament is filled with three-day stories. Like in Genesis chapter 42, Joseph has his brother's put in prison, and after three days, he has them released. In the book of Joshua, there's a story about the spies staying at the home of Rahab, and the enemies come to find the Israelite spies, and she hides them, and three days later, they're free. And think about the story of Esther. To save her people, she fasts and prays for three days, and then she's received on the third day in the presence of the king. Or how about the story of Abraham? going to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. And after three days, God provided a ram. These three-day stories are all over the Old Testament, the first part of the conversation, so much so that Hosea builds on them and the prophet makes this statement, come, let us return to the Lord. After two days, he will revive us on the third day. Day three, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. So when it comes to every one of those stories in the first part of the conversation, the Old Testament, here's the structure of the story. Day one is disappointment. Day two is deep disappointment. And by the way, day two's deep disappointment is affiliated with quiet, like silence. You know what? You can't make it go away. You can't fix it. You can't solve anything. You're just stuck. And you're waiting on day three because the structure of the stories is day three is deliverance. And here is our problem. You don't know it's a three-day story until day three finally comes. In other words, on day two, you think this story may last every day for the rest of your life. Uh, let me kind of give a casual example of what this is like, right? Um, right now, I think we're all super excited about what's happening with Tennessee football, right? <laughs> but many would describe that we've been stuck in day two for a long time right? How long? Anybody got a specific date? 98, 99, everybody gets it, right? That's a humorous example, but for too many in this room, our day two is real, and we're stuck. We're, we're stuck in silence. We're, we're speaking to God. God, hear us. God, help us. God, heal us. God, will you please just do something? And in addition to all the pain and the quiet and the silence, it just feels like God is absent. 
If you're like me, you understand that day twos can be so disorienting. Um, understand, some friends and I have talked about this early in my process a couple months ago, the, the writings of C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis wrote a book about the memoirs called um, Surprised by Joy. It's about how, and we're gonna talk about this throughout this series, that, that how the goodness of God drew him to God in a beautiful way. And he writes the book Surprised by Joy, and it's kind of a play on words because at the age of 57, he was a bachelor till the age of 57. At the age of 57, he meets a woman named Joy, falls in love, and they get married. And three years later, she's diagnosed with cancer, and Joy passes away. And then he follows that book up with another book called A Grief Observed because he's no longer surprised by joy. He, he starts this way in A Grief Observed. When you're happy, so happy you have no sense of needing him, so happy that you're tempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption, if you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate. When all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face, a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside, and after that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seemed so once, and that seemed as strong as this what can this mean? Why is he so present a commander in our time of prosperity and so very absent a help in time of trouble? C.S. Lewis is letting us know day two comes to everyone. And some of you are begging God to save your marriage. Praying again and again and again that a child would come home. It's a guy that meets a girl and he becomes vulnerable and asks her to marry him and she says no. And he's wondering, will he ever find someone else? And day two is when you lose a job, a friend, a spouse, a father, a mother. Day two is waiting in an emergency room, waiting on results. Day two is waiting for a proposal, waiting for some kind of open door, waiting for an interview. Day two is waiting to get pregnant or waiting to get pregnant again or waiting to adopt. Day two is waiting to defeat addiction because you continue to fall. I'm telling you, day two happens to all of us. Again, on, on day one, the dream dies. And you have to ask the question, what do we do on day two? Honestly, there's just a few options. One option is that you give up. Like you can decide, I guess I'll always be tethered to day two. And Paul tells us some people chose that path. Listen, he said in 1 Corinthians 15, but tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? Like when it comes to your disappointment, why are you saying there's no hope? Why are you saying don't ever have hope? Why are you saying don't get your hopes up? It'll never get better. Paul's saying, some are actually saying there is no day three. It's like they're Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore, right? Some people actually live that way. They decide, you know what? I, I'll just say we give up and live a life of despair. Another option is you can fake it and act like everything is okay. Paul described that people, that group of people to someone like Timothy. He said it this way, hey, Timothy, they've left the path of truth. Claiming the resurrection of the dead has already occurred. Like in this way, they've turned some people away from the faith. These people choose not to act like it's real. They act like everything is okay. They choose not to, to grieve. They choose to fake it till they make it. They choose to not be vulnerable. In other words, when it comes to disappointment, these people give simple explanations, superstitious beliefs, easy answers, forced optimism, and cliched formulas. 
But there's a third option. And the third option is on day two. You can wait on God. This does not mean to sit there passively. No, this means on day two, while we're stuck, you continue to work with him. I rest with him. I ask questions with him, hard questions. I get honest with him. I cling to him. I seek to be close to him. In other words, I worship him. Let me let you in on a secret. You can be with God on day two in a way that you can't be with him on any other day. Because on day two, when everything has been ripped away and you're holding on to deep disappointment, you realize your only hope is God. By the way, on behalf of all those three-day stories in the Old Testament, Jesus told one of those three-day stories from the Old Testament in the New Testament. Like it started off with disappointment, deep disappointment, and then all of a sudden, deliverance. He says it this way, Matthew 12, for as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And what Jesus is letting us know is every one of those three-day stories was pointing to the ultimate three-day story where Jesus would be crucified, buried, and risen from the dead. Which reminds all of us that are stuck in deep disappointment. Ready? The worst thing to happen to you is never the last thing to happen to you. So today, whatever your pain, whatever your failure, whatever your regret, whatever your disappointment, this is not the end. It's just day two. Another day is coming. Because after day two, the women went to the tomb, expecting to find more sadness, more heartbreak, a dead body. But the stone was rolled away, the tomb was empty. And Matthew tells it to us like this. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him. Now the angel says, I've told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. Seems a little understated, right? They're devastated. Day two was so long. Day two practically destroyed them. They watched Jesus die on day one. His body was buried, but now he's risen and greetings? It's all he's got? It's like Jesus is letting them and us know, what did you expect? Day twos don't last forever. And so they are listening to this, and you and I should listen to this, and as we kind of wrap today up, the first part of this series, like, if you're stuck in a season of deep disappointment, me too. <laughs> what are you doing day two? I want to tell you two things to cling to. Number one, each other. And do it real tight with deep love. Cling to everyone. Be generous. To each other, be kind to each other, be vulnerable with each other, be thoughtful on behalf of each other. There are people in this room with tremendous grief right now. There are people in this room with lots of questions right now. Some people in this room are afraid to be here right now. 
They swore they'd never go to church again. There's a wide range of people in this room right now. So let's make lots of space for each other and cling to each other. The last two months for me, I couldn't have made it without some of you. I was able to cling to my family, our family, with what they went through. They were able to cling to you. I don't know where we'd be without some of the men in my life, some of the ladies in our family's life, like, like some of the other students. Church, like, this room is special, but this ain't it. You got to find people to cling to during those day two moments. So cling to each other. And then number two, cling to Jesus. If you have not put your trust in him, if you have not gone public with your faith at the waters of baptism, today is a beautiful day to take that step to trust him, to cling to the truth of this whole message that Jesus died for our sin and he was buried and he rose from the dead. That's day three. And he was seen. In other words, on day one, the greatest man who ever lived died. And on two, everything went quiet. The reality is all of us as humans, we live in a day two world. But we worship a day three God. And because of that, this is my prayer for everyone in this room that is stuck in deep disappointment. Paul said in Romans 15, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. And then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you right now are right in the middle of it. I just want to tell you what I'm learning. When you go through deep disappointment, the only thing worse than disappointment with God is disappointment without God. So all across this room right now as you leverage your little day two moment Let's pray together. God, you know every day two that's represented in this room. On behalf of families, on behalf of hurting marriages, on behalf of a relationship that needs to be repaired, on behalf of a husband and wife that want to have children but can't, on behalf of someone that's battling an addiction but can't break. On behalf of those struggling with anxiety, on behalf of people in this room that are still single, single again, God, we acknowledge the hurt, the silence, as we're stuck in day two. But God, help us to remember you do things in day two that you don't do on any other day. Sometimes it's the greatest work that you do in us. And so while we wait, may we wait with you. May we go home with you. May we talk with you. May we sing with you. May we worship you. And while we're doing it, please help us to cling to each other. A bunch of messy people stuck in day two. May we as a church be vulnerable and be honest and be sincere. May we be an encouragement to each other. And by all means, may this church, may we cling to Jesus. God, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for day three. And today we pray in desperation. We can't wait till it comes. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Will you all stand as we sing together? The perfect Son of God in all His innocence and walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. Man of sorrow, son of suffering, blood and tears. How can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Oh, hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Just down in merciful pursuit To the sin of you and grace And the broken you embraced And in the end the proof is in yours It's in the end the proof is in yours Glory to God forever. 